We got uh, Brad Keithley joining us this morning on the phone. And uh, he's, uh, of course, a retired oil and gas attorney and consultant. And he now runs Alaskans for a sustainable budget. He joins us this morning to talk a little bit about um, the budget, which is a huge topic. And we are getting down into it this morning for sure. Brad Keithley. Good morning, sir. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great. How are you this morning? Good, good. Thanks. Uh, thanks for coming in and joining us. I appreciate it. So uh, at first blush, I started looking at this thing and realized, first of all, $400 million right out of the gate, just you know, on paper, right there plainly in front of you, $400 million more than it was. And then you start getting down into the weeds and some of the other stuff, different funds, different monies, forward funding of different things. And all of a sudden you realize you're talking about real money. This governor just doesn't seem to understand that there is a fiscal crisis in the state of Alaska. Well, the governor is selling this as another reduction. If you look at uh, some of the sheets that, that they include with the budget, uh, he's trying to show that there's that there's a reduction, for example, in unrestricted general funds of $300 million in the operating side uh, that carries through to the uh, total uh, total UGF budget, um, and but but when you dig into it, when you start digging into it, you realize that that's a mirage. Uh, that the numbers are in fact um, uh, at least the same in terms of what we traditionally call the budget, the unrestricted general fund, uh, and if not if not higher, uh, there's some accounting gimmickry going along going on uh, <laughs> as we usually see in these budgets, but. But it's uh, you have to dig a little bit to find it in this one. Well, and, and and that's the thing. When we started looking at this, and we're talking again about I, I the numbers that I kind of came up with and reading some of the different analysis and and looking at it. I mean, it really points to almost a billion dollars more than it was last year. Well, it's I'm not sure it's it's that um, it is. Uh, it, there, the, the federal funding uh, that's projected is smaller. They're projecting federal funds uh, for uh, both the operating and the capital side of about $300 million less uh, than they got in the last year. Um, and then they are uh, projecting savings in, in some areas. So the net net looks like uh, it's down uh, because pr primarily uh, because of the reduction in federal funding. It's down uh, a little bit, but it's not the state side uh, is not down. Once you once you look at the numbers uh, and put them all together, the state side is not down uh, at all. Uh, it's mostly attributable. The, the reduction that he's claiming is mostly attributable, attributable to the federal side. So when it's all said and done, uh, I mean, how the how the budget goes is, you know, kind of how the conversation is going to go. Uh, in the upcoming session, uh, he's included in this budget a discussion on a new tax. Uh, obviously, the taking of the PFD, ha over half of it at this point, I guess new projections are saying that it should squeak upwards towards $3,000 is one of the things that I saw yesterday. And so he'll be taking all but 1250 of it. Uh, a fundamental change to the formulation of the PFD plus uh, increases in things like hunting licenses and fishing licenses, gas tax. Uh, I mean, there's just all these different bells and whistles in it. Uh, what's your, you know, what's your take on what's going to be coming up come session time? Uh, and what's the conversation going to be? Well, the first conversation needs to be to sort through the numbers and, and understand what we're talking about. The governor's trying to headline uh, the UGF number as being, uh, four billion dollars, four point oh three three is is what uh, what his numbers would claim the UGF number is. But when you again, when you sort through the numbers, you find out that that four point that four point zero claim uh, isn't right. Once you include uh, things that they sort of tried to put off books, like uh, uh, the contribution to PERS and TERS, and a part of the uh, a part of the of the uh, funding for uh, debt retirement uh, and some other things. Uh, including uh, oil and gas credits, which we'll talk about in a in a minute. But once you once you put all of those back in, we're talking about a budget that's north of 4.5 billion dollars, probably close to probably more than 4.6 billion dollars by the time you make the adjustment for oil and gas tax credits. That's against the budget last year uh, of a UGF budget of 4. Uh, uh, 
$5 billion. So you've got another $100 million uh, in there once you make the adjustments uh, of additions uh, before you even get out of the gate. What, what the, the, the debate that needs to start uh, from the beginning of the session is what's the right budget number? Um, and there's one place in the in the in all of the papers that he's produced that you can find the right budget numbers. It's at the end of a paper that's titled uh, Ten Year Plan." Uh, the title of the paper is "FY 2019 Budget Overview and Ten Year Plan." You can find that on the Office of Management and Budget website. And at the end of that is the Ten Year Plan, and it shows that the uh, th th this plan was prepared without doing the adjustments, at least for retirement and debt, without taking those off book. Uh, and it shows that the number, the budget uh, operating and, and capital budget added together is $4.583 billion. That's still understating oil and gas tax credits, uh, which are only in there at $27 million, probably or around $125 million given current oil prices and current production levels and current projected revenue, right. uh, uh, tax revenue levels. So you had, you, had, you had that together, and you're upwards of, as I say, $4.6, $4.7 um, uh, billion. That's where the discussion needs to start. What the heck is the governor actually proposing in terms of spending? And then we need to, need to start rolling that back. One other thing I think that's important, and, I, and I, I, this 10-year plan – uh, frankly, uh, is is this this sheet I think is hugely important because it shows uh, uh, not only the the spending levels but shows the the projected revenue levels from taxes and the permanent fund and 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 other things. When you look at that ten year plan, uh, the the projected spending what we traditionally talk about is UGF spending. The projected spending is let's say it's four point six billion uh, in FY 2019, it goes to 5.6 billion in 10 years. And and the things that are escalating in there are frightening. You and I talked last week, for example, about retirement. Retirement goes, get, get ready for this, retirement goes in FY 2019 from $245 million to $430 million by, by FY 2028. Whoa. <laughs> so we're showing, we're so yeah, we're showing we're showing huge increases um, in some spending categories uh, across that time period. So not only not only are we spending is the proposal to spend even more in FY 2019 than we spent in FY 2018. The proposal, the 10 year proposal, when you look at it, is to continue those sorts of escalations uh, over the next 10 years. We've got it. I mean, we, you and I have said this now for what, five years, uh, five years going in one form or another, we've got to get a hold of spending, not only because of what it's doing to us in any given year, but when you look, when you project that out over the future, what it's doing to us in the future. This legislature needs to start by, on the spending side, getting the right number and then digging into ways to, to alter uh, not only the current year trajectory on spending, but future year tra uh, trajectory on spending. Yeah, and that's what really worries me. I mean, we've been focusing primarily on the short-term impact on the economy right now. But when you start taking a look at a 10-year plan that is going to escalate and escalate and escalate, and we start talking about the, you know, the magic of compounding and all this other kind of stuff, we're talking about seriously, I mean, this, is, this has got serious impacts for future generations of Alaskans simply because we've got legislators that are not making the hard choices to cut back on the size and scope of government. Yeah, exactly right. E even, th even this plan, uh, with all of the additional revenues that he's throwing in, uh, even this plan is showing this ten-year plan is showing a deficit of around five hundred million dollars, and this is this is half a billion dollars. This is after this is after cutting the PFD uh, uh, again for the third year in a row. It's after the motor fuels tax. It's after um, uh, the what he calls the Alaska Economic uh, Recovery Act, which is really a, a, a pseudonym for a payroll tax. Uh, we're still in the hole by, five, by, by roughly $500 billion. That goes, looking at the 10-year projection, that goes up next year to $489 uh, million, goes up the following year to $550 million. And then there's some projection of it coming down. But, but, <laughs> and, but it still stays in deficit for the next four years. So if you think, if you think that, that the Econo Alaska Economic Recovery Act 
uh, uh, payroll tax is a temporary tax, then you must have believed the Matsu Bureau when they told you the sales tax <laughs> was going to be was going to be a temporary tax. <laughs> that you, you you can't see your you can't see your way clear to to a, to a temporary tax in the in when you look at the ten year plan. Well, and that's that's part of the problem. I mean, they they keep saying, "Oh, this is only three years. This is only this. This is only that." But the foot in the door, of course, is a the tax at a lower rate, which they can then up down the road. And of course, once it's in. Unless it's got a sunset that, and you're really willing to hold these politicians' feet to the fire, it's impossible to remove. Yeah, yeah. Well, and 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 what's driving it? I mean, is the same thing has been driving it for the last five years. What's driving it is is spending, is having to deal with uh, the the consequences of of the formula programs. Uh, that, that the Medicaid formula program, the K through 12 formula program, having to deal with the, the the size of a university that we've built that we're still trying to maintain, we're still trying to keep uh, three universities going. Uh, the size of the government, uh, the size of the public employee role that we've got. I mean, we're we're trying to maintain that, and that is what is uh, driving uh, those numbers up. So what- if we don't if we if we don't get, if we don't get our arms around that. Uh, then, then we just we keep going down the down the hill. Well, that's exactly that's exactly what's happening, and of course, all that we're seeing right now, for the most part, uh, from the leadership anyway of both bodies, is spend, spend, spend. Uh, you know, take the PFD. Uh, not really looking at any more spending cuts. Not looking at anything that's that's going to uh, uh, you know to slow that down at all. The governor, of course, like I said earlier, he's driving the bus as far as the conversation with this budget. He puts the budget out. The legislature works over it, and nobody seems to be willing to do what we're talking about, Brad. That's the problem. It is uh, the Republicans. The Republicans in the Senate the last two years have have taken the easy way out instead of frankly, doing the hard work necessary to go into these formula programs and go into the university system and go uh, into the other big budget items and cut spending further, uh, they've taken the easy way out by cutting the PFD. Uh, the one formula program that says it, that in, a, in the statute says you shall pay. None of the other formula programs say that. So the, they've gone into the one for, formula program and, uh, that says by law you shall pay and, and cut it. Uh, instead of making the hard decisions on 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 the spending programs uh, elsewhere in the budget, and and if they don't if they don't get their arms around that, uh, they're not only failing this generation of Alaskans who suffer from PFD cuts, they're failing future generations of Alaskans who are going to suffer from what has to be additional PFD cuts and and taxes on top of that. We can't the, the revenue base we have doesn't support this level of spending. Um, uh, into the future, particularly when you look at the increases that they're projecting across the board. What what should this budget have looked like, Brad? I guess you know we, we're looking at what's going on in there and what's happening and everything. What should the governor had come back with? I mean, what what should what should the differences have been? Well, it, in 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 my opinion, we should have looked at a realistic uh, projection of oil prices, a realistic projection of. Of, uh, of oil production, what you can get from from production taxes, Hammond's other 50 percent, uh, after dealing with inflation proofing in some fashion, Hammond's other 50 percent. Look at what that sort of revenue base gives you on a long term sustainable basis, uh, and and then and then look at what sort of revenues you get uh, out of that, and then fit spending inside inside of that revenue, and that means that means you're going to have to cut. That's going to be it's going to be a number that's in the three to eight, three point eight, three point seven five to four billion dollar range, somewhere in there. When you look at those two things and project it out over the years ahead, and and that's going to be the revenue base that you're going to have. So you're going to have to fit spending um, inside of that, and that frankly means major changes to the university system to go back to a single university to get university spending down to the levels that uh, that that the peer groups that the university system itself. Uh, says that it looks to for for various things to get spending state spending on the on the university system down to something we can afford and frankly to concentrate it in one in one university in a way that can make that a a very strong university as opposed to having three weak universities they're going to have to go into into K through 12 and figure out 
Um, we haven't looked at K through 12 at, at the VSA funding since 2008. Uh, that's now about 10 years ago. That's frankly, that may be the longest we've ever gone without looking at the BSA. Uh, they're going to have to go into the BSA and figure out cost savings that can be achieved in the BSA. That may mean consolidation of schools. It may mean a number of things, but we need to bring those down. The long and the short of it is you, you figure out what your revenue is, what your revenue base can support, and then you fit spending inside it. That's what, that's, what, uh, that's what we should be doing. What this governor has done and what this legislature has permitted him to do, including the Republican side of the Senate, what they've permitted him to do instead is to go out and say, well, this is the kind of government I want in the, in the, in the, in the world that I want to create, right. uh, which is a government that, conti that continues to have the three university system um, and continues to have uh, cases of the VSA uh, uh, continue going in the way it's, it's, it's going. Um, and then, oh, now I, need now I need to raise revenues to support that. And that includes PFD cuts and then includes uh, what he's talking about as the, as the temporary, so-called temporary um, uh, payroll tax. So we're, we're, in my opinion, we're going at it backwards. He's looking at spending first and then revenue to match spending. Um, in, in, in my world, you look at revenue first, what you can afford, and then you fit spending within the revenue. We're talking with Brad Keithley, who's with Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget, uh, here on the Michael Duke Show uh, at michaeldukeshow.com, live around the world on Facebook and YouTube. Um, Brad, this is, I think you just nailed it on the head. I mean, we have to look at the revenue side first. We as individuals, as citizens. Um, I can't just do my monthly budget and say, here's the lifestyle I'd like to live. Now let's go do it and then figure out how to pay for it later. But this has been a problem with government. I mean, we're seeing it. We're seeing it at the national level. You know, we've seen a, you know, the deficit balloon up to 20 plus trillion dollars uh, just in the last 10, 15 years uh, up from, you know, it's, it's increased tenfold. Uh, and, and yet nobody sees that there's any kind of penalty for that. I mean, I see that there could be a penalty for that in the future, but nobody else seems to see it. I mean, this is a problem. Um, quite honestly, this nationwide, there's hundreds and hundreds of municipalities and governments that are doing exactly what the state and what the Congress is doing. And there just doesn't seem to be any ramifications for it, I guess. Yeah, it's all about the here and now. It's all about, you know, give me give me the benefit of, uh, of give me money now and and let the future I'll, – I'll just leave the future to itself. We've seen the consequences of that in Alaska. Uh, I've been having this discussion with, with, with friends and others about, about the federal uh, income tax bill. Uh, it looks nice on the surface, but then when you realize that it increases the, the, the deficit by – even under dynamic scoring, even taking into account the potential for, for economic growth – by over a trillion dollars, and and you look at what that means in future years uh, uh, in terms of tax increases that you're going to, or cost increases, spending increases you're going to have to have to uh, deal with in order to, to to respond to that increased debt. We're just we're just you know they're looking at the here and now. Oh good, you know I get a I get a tax deduction right now. But yes, right. look at what's happening five and six and seven and eight, nine, ten, beyond that years down the road. We, we've got experience with that in Alaska. I mean, we had that, we had that in 2012 when, when you and I started talking about this stuff. Uh, in 2012, you could see this, you could see this, this situation coming uh, in terms of, of what we were doing to our long-term uh, uh, economic outlook, our long-term fiscal outlook. Uh, and, you know, we started talking about it. You've got to worry about the next thing. But in 2012, it was all, oh, no. Uh, we've got plenty of money right now. Uh, we need to build uh, a new athletic center at uh, Athletic Arena at the University of Alaska Anchorage. We need to build two new engineering buildings, one at the right, banks, one, right. one in Anchorage. We we need to, we need to astroturf every you know football field we've got there, high school football field we've got in this state. It, it was just you know we've got the money. It's burning a hole in our pocket. We got to spend it, and everybody was going, yeah, give it to me now. But, but we can see what the consequences of that approach is in Alaska uh, because we're facing them right now. We're facing uh, PFD cuts or taxes or, or reduction in state services. That's where this leads. Um, and, and if we don't face up to it, uh, and this budget doesn't face up to it, and the legislature hasn't faced up to it, if we don't face up to it, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse uh, going forward. We've got a chance to dig out of it. 
but but we've got to take that chance. We can't just say, oh, I'll do that next year after I get through this. Well, <clears throat> and, and this is my fear. My fear is is that we're not going to learn. I mean, we're we're not seeing it. Um, and, and so I guess my my question to you is, how can we, the citizens, how can we stop this? How can we get our voice to be heard? I mean, we've got, like you said, there's no interest in the Republican majority in the Senate. There's obviously no interest in the House majority, uh, the Democratic House majority. The governor obviously is living in a fantasy world. And we are the ones that have to pick up the pieces on the other side. We're the ones that have to pay for all the taxes and everything else, deal with the economic ramifications on the economy. I mean, what can we do right now to reverse this before it gets any worse? Because, I mean, that's all you're painting is you're painting this lovely picture, Merry Christmas to you, Brad, on how bad everything <laughs> is going. I mean, we're talking about a 10-year plan where we still have half-billion-dollar deficits, you know, four, five, six years down the road. When when they're going to be instituting taxes and everything else. Yeah. So, the, I mean, we've got people who make the decision about whether this this goes on or not. It's the governor and the legislature. And and those are the people I mean, those are the people under the Constitution that are always going to make this decision. So if you want if you want if we want different decisions, those people are either going to have to change their tune. And, and it doesn't look like they are um, because they haven't. Uh, over the last few years, as we've as we've addressed this crisis, uh, or we got to change the people. We've got to have have different people in there, and that's going to lead us, you and I, during this coming year, to talk about different uh, uh, electing different governor candidates. Uh, you know what, how strong they are on the on the overall economy, how strong they are on getting spending down. Uh, different legislators. Uh, I, you know, w- w- in the last election cycle, we had uh, we had people who 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 Republicans who ran and. Uh, uh, ran against Democrats, and the Republicans had voted for PFD cuts, and uh, 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 we were upset. People were upset about that, but they said, "Oh, let's reelect them anyway. They'll see the light. Other people will come in. They'll understand what they're doing. We'll we'll get this back under control. They'll make the spending cuts." Didn't happen. Um, you know, Kathy Giesel <laughs> and, and John Coghill, after voting for PFD cuts, got reelected, and they went back in there and they voted for PFD cuts again. And they said, "Look, you know, we got reelected after doing it, so there's really yeah, no there's no penalty." Well, yeah. if you continue if if you continue reelecting those people, uh, that's exactly the 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 outcome you're going to have. So um, it's <laughs> we're going to have to change out unless the legislature. Uh, unless those in the legislature start going in a different direction, you're going to have to ch- change out the legislators. And that may mean uh, uh, primary challenges. I hope it does, frankly, in some situations re- result in primary challenges. And it may mean uh, electing uh, electing different people when it comes to the general election time. But but if the people aren't going to – if the people in those roles aren't going to change, then we need to change the people. Well, and, and that's the thing. I mean, I, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again. And how you expect to send the same group of people that got us into this situation in the first place. A lot of these players have been there for 7, 8, 9, 10, 12 years. And so they were through those high times and the heydays, and they were the ones that were spending money like drunken sailors. How you think that without that sending those same people back are now, of course, assuring you, oh, we— We'll fix this. We, you know, oh, we're the guys to do it. We can take care of it um, is literally the definition of insanity. And, and that means that some other folks are going to have to step up to the plate. I mean, are there, you know, do, have you heard of it? You, you say you're hoping that there's some primary challengers. Have you heard any of these big races that, you know, that uh, where where these challengers might come in and make a difference? Oh, I think if Anna McKinnon, for example, runs for re-election in the Eagle River Eagle River district, that there will be a challenger to her in that district. Uh, there's been a rumor that Tuckerman Babcock is going to take on Peter Machecki down in the uh, down in the Kenai. I haven't I haven't heard a rumor about either uh, uh, Pete Kelly or Click Bishop up in Fairbanks. But if we start getting people to 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 step up in some of these districts, then uh, my my hope would be that they start looking up at they start stepping up in other districts. Mia Costello is another one. Mia Costello, uh, M- Mia Costello's uh, voting record on fiscal issues and economic issues is just bad. Uh, and and surely West Anchorage can do better than uh, than 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 the record that she's developed over there. And uh, hopefully there's somebody that steps up in that election. There's there there are now three people I think 
in the in the uh, uh, House primary in Jason Gren's district on the Republican side, three people uh, running for the Republican nomination uh, uh, to run against Jason Gren. I would I would encourage one of them to step up and run in the primary against uh, Senator Costello because Senator Costello is one of those people who will talk a good game, talk about you know, how she's tried to bring spending down, how she's tried to do and, and how she's tried to do that. But she's been a reliable vote for PFD cuts and a reliable vote for keeping spending at, at, at the levels that, that require uh, PFD cuts. So I, I see no reason uh, – I see no uh, uh, expectation that sending her back would, would, would do any good. Uh, it's just it's, it's just going to keep us going down the the record that the that the governor's ten year plan is showing. It, maybe there's, there's a couple other pieces. I was just going to say maybe there's a maybe there's a, a representative Brad Keithley in there somewhere or what? I mean, I'm just asking. <laughs> I'm just asking Senator Brad well, Keithley. Got, I mean, you know, <laughs> we've we've already got a we've already got a Republican candidate in the district that I live in. Yeah. Um, uh, and and we and we don't need another. Um, uh, so it's um, I, but but there. He, well, I, I, if I did live in a district, if I did live in a district that had one of these senators, I would be tempted uh, because it just it's it's an easy thing to do. Yeah, I mean, look, they they, they you go back to find sound bites where they said, you know, we're going to cut spending, we're going to you know hold the line, we're going to you know avoid PFD cuts, and those sound bites are back there. You run those and you say, and here's the record, uh, and and it isn't cutting spending, and it isn't, uh, and it is making PFD cuts. So. It's just, I mean, you just run them against themselves. You go back and find the old sound bites and, and, and say, you know, this is what the senator promised or this is what the representative promised. They didn't live up to it. Yeah. And go from there. There's a couple other things, Michael, in the budget that, that are worth talking about. Okay. Uh, one, is, one is the governor's proposed Alaska Economic Recovery Act, uh, which is funded by uh, this so-called temporary uh, payroll tax. Uh, there's a few things that I want to mention on that, and then the other is uh, is a proposal, a new proposal, yet another new proposal, on how to deal with oil tax credits, um, and and the governor's proposal for how to deal with that. And I and I think both of those have uh, have issues in them um, uh, that are worth discussing. We'll start that start yeah. that discussion here, and we'll continue it through the session, but. But I think they both have issues in them that, that need to be discussed. Well, let's take a crack at it. I mean, we got uh, we're we're going on here. I guess I'll reset and say we're talking with Brad Keithley, who is uh, with Alaskans for a sustainable budget. He and I have been talking about these issues as he's pointed out for many years, and it just doesn't seem like many of these politicians. There's a few that are listening, but the ones that are in power just don't seem to care that much. Uh, and we're talking about the budget right now. Uh, so, Brad, uh, the oil and gas tax credits I know is a big deal. You did some deeper analysis on this you were talking specifically about you know this is like paying off your house well before you need to with absolutely no fiscal gain for you to do so uh, i mean uh, you know paying it off and not having to pay you know a huge mortgage interest loan is one thing but paying it off by damaging yourself at the same time just doesn't seem to make sense yeah and 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 to, to set to, to set the baseline here uh the oil and gas tax credit uh statute as it's been in place since the beginning of the program, is that this, it's, it's that the state will pay off the tax credits um, uh, as the state has the revenues to do so. So when, in periods when we have high production tax revenues, we'll pay a high amount toward the oil and gas tax credits. In periods when we have low production tax revenues, we'll pay a low amount toward the oil and gas tax credits. That's what it's been. That's the provisions that have been there since the beginning of the program. The, the those who participated in the program knew that from the outset. Yeah, I just uh, I wanted to I wanted I wanted to make that clear because there seems to be a lot of squawking about you promised you'd pay and you're not paying the states. Def, you know, basically, you know, just d screwing us on this deal. They knew all the details of this when they went into it. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And they and 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 what happened was the the, the bet was their bet was. That oil prices or oil production levels wouldn't go down because that's what drives production tax revenues, and 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 the bet was well, they won't go down, so we'll get paid we'll get paid at high levels because it'll be high production tax uh, revenues. Well, in 2014 when oil prices went down, in 2015 and 2016 uh, when they stayed down, the statute operated to reduce uh, the amount of of payment that was required because the state didn't have as much money. The statute operated to reduce the amount the state was required to pay. And 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 
then the second that risk that the producers accepted uh, came home to roost, they started squawking about it, and they wanted uh, they wanted to be paid, notwithstanding what the statute provided in terms of in terms of <laughs> those reductions, and and for reasons that have have never been clear to me, um, uh, they have had substantial support both in this administration and in the legislature to try to find ways to make those payments. The first approach was we'll just pay them off. We'll just pay a bunch of money. Uh, we'll just take a bunch of money more than we have an obligation to pay. And as you were using the mortgage analogy, uh, we'll just pay our mortgage early and pay it off and, and make them happy. Well, that's at the expense of taking that money out of our savings, out of the state savings, right? Taking right. it out of our investments. So the state, the state's a loser under that. They're coming back now with a new proposal, essentially for the state to go out and issue debt, um, issue bonds to raise money, to then uh, uh, raise enough money to pay off the producers in advance. And I will give give one piece of credit for this. Uh, this version of the program has the producers uh, taking a discount on the payments that they that they that they uh, the, the, on the amounts that they otherwise are, are are entitled to has them taking a discount to essentially pay the state for the cost of that debt. But there's still cost to the even if the producers did that, there's still cost to the state from issuing debt. One is we're using up our debt capacity. If we have a problem. Uh, in the next year, if we have a 64 earthquake, if we have something that happens where we have to go out and issue debt, we've just used up a portion of of our debt capacity to uh, to fund uh, uh, to, to hand it over to the producers in advance. So right. that we've shifted the risk from the producers who accepted that risk at the time they had the program uh, over to the state uh, by the state going out and issuing the debt and and having the and using up its debt capacity. The other thing is the, the, the discount schedule that the, that, that the state's talking about using um, in, in, in charging the producers for, for this early payment, the discount schedule is, is, is premised upon uh, a projection of oil price and, pr and production levels uh, that the state's using for other purposes. Well, that's good uh, if, if those oil prices and production levels uh, occur. Uh, then maybe we've still used up debt capacity, but maybe we're, we, we come out whole. But if oil prices drop off again or if production prices drop off again, hope that they don't. But if they do, the risk of that's just been transferred to the state because we're, we, we've paid that money out. Right. We're obligated to pay these bonds back on a schedule as opposed to the reduced schedule that the statute would provide. So. How, however they've tried to do it, however they've tried to upfront this money to the producers, it's always been at the expense of the state and transferring risk that the producers accepted up, up front over to the state. I think this program that, they're, that they've included in this package is not quite as bad because they've got the discount feature in there, but is still at the expense of the state um, uh, when the state, the state has no reason – uh, to take that on, there's no statutory obligation to take that on. Right. Uh, no, uh, no business reason to take it on, and I just I don't understand why the state. And what's the impetus here, Brad? I mean, what? I mean, I mean, I'm not. I know you're not Kreskin or anything, but why? I mean, why? Why this fervor to get it paid out when the statute is very clear as to how it should be done? I I I think the producers have better lobbyists. I mean, I, I, I think that, that they've come in, they've said, oh my gosh, we're having trouble raising capital out in the public market. Uh, we're having uh, difficulty getting our projects financed. You, uh, you promised, um, uh, and they drag out this one brochure. <laughs> Don't look at the statute. No, look at this brochure over here. They drag out this one brochure right. that, that in fact references the statute, but they drag out this one brochure and say, you promised to pay these. Um, and, um, uh, and, and, you know, try to, try to do guilt trip and try to do, oh, poor us. We can't, we can't explore, or we can't produce, or we can't develop as much. Now, this is at a time when, when cat, when, when you find articles in the wall street journal, the financial times, and the Houston Chronicle, all talking about the huge amount of capital that's coming back into the industry uh, as oil prices have gone up. You find, you know, articles about uh, uh, producers getting their fund their programs funded uh, through new debt issuances and other things. So they come up here and and they cry about not being able to do it. I I just don't think it's I just don't think it's 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 legitimate uh, on their part. The statute doesn't provide it, and I don't understand why the state ought to take on additional risk that that we carefully 
protected ourselves against from the start. Right. And and seemed to make I mean that seemed to make a lot of sense when they put all those, you know, features and bells and whistles in there to to, you know, protect the state from it. And now it just feels like that again, this feels like another giveaway from the legislators where it's just one more special interest that's going to be served uh, again, at the peril of the citizens of the state of Alaska, uh, in this case, the tax credits, you know, in other cases, it's the, you know, the university system or something else. My ox won't get gored. You can't, you know, I'm, I'm all for I'm all for living within our means, unless, of course, I'm talking about uh, unless, of course, I'm talking about my special interest, in which case I'm not really interested in it, which, again, is kind of more the same of what we were just talking about. Well, yeah, and that and that that's a great segue into talking about the Alaska Economic Recovery Act, the other the other new piece of the governor's budget. That act proposed that's where the payroll tax is, and that act proposes to 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 in a, to have a three year payroll tax and essentially take that money that's raised through the payroll tax and transfer it over to the construction industry. Uh, another of the another of the special interests uh, that are out there. The construction industry is has been upset. That uh, that construction uh, budgets have been low the last few years. Uh, they uh, are, are are asserting that uh, the state is uh, uh, is is undermining the construction industry in the state. And so, rather than in the past, the governor has proposed higher construction budgets, um, but they've been cut back. Now they now they're trying it through the uh, through a payroll tax and targeting that payroll tax. Uh, in what they call the Alaska Economic Recovery Act, which is supposed to go to, quote, shovel-ready, uh, close quote, projects, uh, capital projects, and, and put additional money uh, into the construction industry. The problem with that, Michael, is is it's one more thing that we're doing for a special interest. ICER's analysis last year, 2016, uh, when looking at the bang for the buck the state's, state gets out of various things, when they when we put money into the construction industry, a dollar that goes into the construction industry only produces 60 cents of income on average uh, to the overall Alaska economy. A ton of that money goes out of state uh, for specialty products, steel, uh, uh, and and various other things that are needed in construction projects. So we only get back 60 cents of of a dollar that we put into that in terms of income. The PFD, on the other hand, according to the ICER study, when you when you send out a dollar in a PFD, it generates a dollar forty uh, in income uh, in the Alaska economy. It's it bounces around the Alaska economy two or three times, generates additional income on top of the initial dollar that goes into it, and ultimately generates, according to the ICER study, a dollar forty in income. So what what the Economic Recovery Act is to take is to take even more money out of the out of the private sector through these payroll taxes and then target it on the construction industry to help you know to help bolster a construction uh, uh, budget uh, a capital budget that otherwise uh, otherwise is 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 low uh, from the standpoint of what it was in the 2010 through 2014 period targeted on the construction uh, or on the capital budget bolster the construction industry but they're doing it at the expense of the overall Alaska economy not only are we taking money out of the private sector and, and then running it through government to target it on this one industry but we're but at the same time we're still cutting the PFD the thing that gives us the biggest bang for the buck right uh, in order to target money on th- the thing that gives us the lowest bang for the buck uh, in terms of in terms of overall income, so it's it it's just the same thing that we were talking about with the with the oil and gas tax credits. It's targeting, it's giving special treatment uh, to one industry, trying to respond to the lobbyists uh, in one industry at the expense of the overall Alaska economy. And we're doing it in the midst of a recession, just the, right. most, the worst possible time to be undermining the overall economy. Well, you and I have talked about this, where there's a lot of businesses in the state of Alaska that have, you know, basically built their house on sand. I mean, they've built their entire business model uh, based on government largesse, government contracts and everything else. And when that money starts to dry up, they're the ones that pound the pavement the hardest and send the lobbyists in and do the public PR campaigns and everything else because they've made a bad choice. 
when it comes to their business model. They've made a business model that's based on government spending instead of on the free markets and what the actual demand is out there. They'd like it to be artificially propped up. And like you just pointed out, in the worst way possible, getting a 60 cent return on every dollar versus putting that dollar back into the economy in the in the form of a PFD or something else where it turns one, one and a half times in the economy. That's not good sound fiscal advice. It isn't. And, and this is the kind of state we've built. We've built a state that has a big budget that supports various special interest groups build up at a time when we had when we frankly had a lot of spare cash that should have been invested uh, to generate returns for periods like this. But setting that aside, when we had a lot of cash, people said, oh, you know, help me build up the university system. Help me build up oil and gas tax credits. Help me or the oil and gas industry. Help me build up um, uh, 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 the construction industry. And, and the state said, sure. And so we built up all these industries, and now, and 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 as you say, they're all dependent on government largesse. Right. And now that we've hit uh, hit the conditions, we've hit. Uh, uh, it's, I mean, they're they don't want to they don't they don't want to play by the rules. The oil, the oil and gas industry, for example, doesn't want to play by the rules anymore. They don't want to play by the limits that are on the oil, that are on the oil and gas tax credits. They just want to change the rules. All right, Brad. Well, we're running the clock out here. Brad Keithley has been our guest. Uh, final thoughts, Brad. Christmas time. I, you just had a great. Uh, you just had a great experience. You want to share anything with us here for our Christmas joy before we head on out? Yeah, for me, go listen to, to find a concert in a church uh, uh, or, or at the Anchorage Concert Association or Anchorage Symphony or something. Go find music. I I went to uh, a few concerts on this run. They ended, uh, two separate concerts ended with uh, Old Ang Syne, beautiful versions of Old Ang Syne, and it just lifted my spirits and got me got me in the Christmas mood. So yeah. for me, go find, my, my advice is go find music. Yeah, I was following you on Facebook and stuff and just thinking, man, that's got to be some great stuff to see this, see the plays and the singing and the dancing and everything else. It's just, it's an amazing, uh, amazing opportunity and a good time to remember, uh, you know, again, get into that 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 seasonal spirit and everything else. Well, Brad Keithley, Merry Christmas to you, my friend. I appreciate you coming on, and uh, we will uh, we'll hit back with you next week and see what kind of new stuff we can dig up on these budgets and everything else, and maybe we can get these guys in line. We appreciate you coming on board the program. Michael, thank you for having me as always. I uh, I appreciate it. Brad Keithley is our guest.